Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Center for Science of Information Spring Seminar Series. My name is Brent Ladd and I serve as the Director of Education for the Center. And today we are really excited to present the first Channel Scholar project in the series. And just really briefly, the Channel Scholar program is a unique academic year research experience for undergraduates that's organized and funded by the center. And as a science and technology center that's funded by the National Science Foundation, we've had the privilege of working with 129 undergraduates across 17 different universities. So you can learn more about the program at our website, along with some other initiatives that we have going. SOIHub.org will get you there. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Natalie, uh, and is it McGuckin? I'm sorry, I forgot. That's yeah, McGuck Natalie McGuckin. So Natalie is an undergraduate student at Purdue University pursuing a double major in data visualization and web programming and design. And she also currently serves as a resident assistant for the data mine learning community. And prior to this role, she was the inaugural chair of the data mine advisory board. And if you haven't heard of the data mine, I recommend you check it out. It's a terrific uh, learning community at Purdue that engages hundreds of students now with data science that makes it really relevant to their major interests. Uh, let's see, so she has also acted as a corporate partner mentor for the data mine cohort. Natalie is passionate about her research. Uh, this is her third year as a channel scholar uh, looking into data science, mathematical modeling, and visualization. Her project has been in collaboration with Dr. Mark Daniel Ward, who is the director of the Data Mine, interim director of the Integrative Data Science Initiative at Purdue, and a professor in statistics here at Purdue. So with that, thank you again, Natalie, for presenting today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brent. All right, let's get started. Can I can I say something before you start? I don't I don't know who our friend Cameron is, so I I don't want to say something unusual. But I see there's two other McGuckins on the call, so yeah. I just I just want to brag a little on on Natalie as just this research she's going to talk about has been transformative. I don't use that word very often. I'm not someone who likes to exaggerate, but I I've worked on this problem for a very very long time and and not worked on it alone and Natalie's involvement the last three years has just just been a monumental contribution and then Brent has alluded to her leadership both in the data mine and in Hillebrand as an RA and uh, in in all regards she's one of the really good ones we feel lucky to have you in our group Natalie so Thank thanks you. for coming and sharing your work today. Of course, anytime. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Yeah, and whose <laughs> office did you steal there? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm in my favorite professor's research office. So I'm in Dr. Ward's <laughs> office, for all of you who don't know. Uh, Cameron on the on the line is one of my best friends at Purdue. We study together a lot. So oh, I'm okay. happy you're here, Cameron. <laughs> Yeah, so Nat Natalie's worked hard on this presentation, and I, if I, if I say so, she's planning to present this at a at a national math conference next week that occurs every year in Rose Holman in Terre Haute, mm -hmm. uh, and and we thought it's nice to share this amongst friends, and then you know share it even more publicly yes, at the end of the true. academic year. So, and Brent, thanks so much for making all this possible for Natalie. Oh, it's my pleasure uh, to see students like Natalie uh, progress in both research and their studies. I mean, that's why we're here. <laughs> we don't so, have so many students like Natalie, though. <laughs> I, know, I know. Yeah, so we're happy to highlight her, her product progress and her passion for, for data visualization and research. And uh, she's going to have a bright future for sure. So. Okay, we're going to make her blush if we go on. I know. Too much. Okay, all right. It's, I'm sorry to interrupt. I couldn't help it. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Warrior. Thank you, Brent. All right. Are we all ready to get started? Learn about some yeah. All right. Learn about some game theory. Let's go. Okay. So about me. Hi. My name is Natalie McGuckin, and I'm a junior studying data visualization and web programming and design. This is my third year being a part of the data mine learning community. This year, I'm a corporate partners mentor for the corporate partners learning community. In addition to that, I'm a resident assistant. Prior to that role, I was the chair of the Data Mine Advisory Board, where we planned professional development events for the Data Mine Learning Community in Hill and Brand Hall. 
Um, I like to consider myself an avid learner. I really enjoy learning data visualization and data science techniques. So first I will talk to you about the underlying math for the large game theory problem. Then we will get into the visualization tool with finally wrapping up and talking about my future work on the research. So we are a research team made up of different institutions all over the country. My research mentor, Dr. Ward, is in the middle of this picture here, and he has been working on this project for 15 years. Dr. Ward is extremely involved in the Purdue community and just to scratch the surface at what he does, he is a professor in the statistics department. He is also the associate director of the CSOI, and he is also the director of the data mine learning community, which I've been a part of for three years. So consider the following two player game. The game begins with a pile of matchsticks between two players. That is what NIM is. We're about to get into that. Sorry, my computer just froze for a second. Okay. I apologize, my computer just froze. This is the new normal now. It really is. <laughs> okay, let's see. Yeah, so the goal of this project is to understand the underlying structure of the mathematics for a large game theory problem, NIM. Okay, so consider the following two player game. The game begins with a pile of matchsticks between the two players. The players take turns removing matchsticks from the pile under the restriction that the number of matchsticks one returns in a turn is a predetermined set of natural numbers called a subtraction set. The player who takes the last matchstick wins. These games are called subtraction games. Subtraction games are widely studied and are related to the game of NIM, which this research is based on. There are two ways to play NIM. We have normal play where the last player to move at the end of the game is the winner. And then we have misere play where the last player to make the move is the loser. So the secret to finding the winning strategy depends on the sizes of the piles, the number of matches in each row from the picture that we just saw in binary, and then adding those numbers up. However, we don't use the ordinary way of adding numbers, but something appropriately called NIM sum. To add the given binary numbers using NIM sum, you must first write them underneath each other as you might for ordinary addition. Then you look at each of the columns in turn. If the number of ones in a column is odd, you write a one underneath it. If it's even, then you would write a zero underneath it, as we can see here. Doing this for each column gives a new binary number, and that's the result of the NIM sum. In combinatorial game theory, a subtraction game is an abstract strategy game whose state can be represented by a natural number or vector of numbers in the scenario, which you can only move values in the subtraction set x, y, and z, or as we can see on the screen, s1, s2, s3. NIM values have an eventual periodicity of three. Subtraction game, the subtraction game is made up of three elements. When it is your turn, you can only take from the subtraction set x, y, z. For each triple, we have a subtraction game. So this is an example of what the period, the underlying math for the subtraction game looks like. The way these jump sizes work is that it is the smallest number that you cannot jump back to. So for example, with number 16 on the end, we can jump back two and then we'll get one. We jump back four and we'll get zero. We jump back seven and then we get zero which leaves us with one, zero, and zero, which means that for the answer, we would get two for right here. As we start to calculate NIM, val NIM values have an eventual periodicity of three. So for another example, if we look back at 15 right here, we jump back two, we would get two. Jump back four, we would get one. And then we get and then if we jump back seven, we would get one. So we are left with our answer of zero. 
Once again, it is the smallest number that you cannot jump back to. Our numbers start to repeat and our repeating number for this is 102. This is periodic. Now we know everything for the rest of, so since it's periodic, we would know what it looks like now for the rest of time. So um, this is great. So like we don't have to do, um, like if this set is maybe like as long as like 2 million, we would only have to go back to how much it repeats. So that's what's just so special about this. So subtraction sets of size three have one of these period lengths on the screen. The research team grouped these different period codes by color. When we see the visualization tool later, these colors will make more sense. P stands for periodicity. A periodicity means reoccurring at regular intervals. Each color represents one of the different period code types that we conjecture classify the length of the repeating periods for any given game. This is, a, this is an example of putting it all together. So our P, which is three, is not a divisor of Y plus Z, which is four plus seven. Our greatest common divisor is six comma nine. Our subtraction set fits with period code four, so we know that the periodicity's length is purple. However, not all colors are equal. For example, not all purples are made equal. You can mathematically fit to be considered period code four and be purple. But if your numbers started differently with the jump sizes that we did earlier, they would technically be considered different even though they are classified as the same number and the same period. So in particular, the famous Sprague-Grundy theorem implies that any subtraction game is equivalent to the game of NIM having only a single pile. The size of such pile is said to be a NIM value or a Grundy number of a subtraction game. NIM value and Grundy number are the same. Impartial games are two-player games in which the player takes turns making moves where the moves are available from. And the position does not depend on whose turn it is. Partisan games give potential moves for the players are different. Chess is an example of a partisan game. Oh, can I throw in one comment? Yeah, of course. I, f I forgot to mention there's a point of humor here. People joke that these kind of games, these combinatorial games, are games that mathematicians play. And then there's a rebuttal to that, which says these kind of games are games that people don't play. You know, <laughs> whereas chess is a game that people actually play. <laughs> these types of games Natalie is mentioning are games people don't actually play. <laughs> Okay, I don't know what that says about us, but. So Milton like Bradley won't be contacting you? Is that what you're it, It's quite unlikely. <laughs> okay, but the mathematicians care. Yeah. Thank you for that comment, Dr. <laughs> Just as a point of levity, because I know you're about to switch gears here after this, this slide. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. So for our computation, um, we have over 100 petabytes of data that goes into this project. It's a lot of data. Um, we have three clusters that we store our data on and, our, and we run our computations on. They are Brown, Scholar, and Halstead. So Brown has the most cores with 24 cores per node with Scholar and Halstead following with 20 cores per node. In the data mine, we actually use Scholar to do our projects on. So now we're moving to the visualization approach. So we want to be able to see a holistic view of the data structure along with wanting to see the fine grained details in a certain region. Through a data visualization approach, we can see how the structure is behaving at different regions, which gives the team a better idea of the structure and how it is behaving. We routinely use the visualization tool to zoom into the space, revealing the fine grained details of the attributes for the space in a way that would be impossible without the tool. The visualization approach is crucial because the mathematical structure is recursive. But, but you need to mention this is, this is your tool, my friend. You know, this is Natalie's super big contribution. We had another tool 
what six or seven years ago and it it was nice it was very good but it only led us to this certain point and then when natalie joined the team she she is solely responsible for the tool she's going to show everybody here i did get a lot of support and guidance from the team though so that is definitely worth mentioning so the visualization approach is crucial because the mathematical structure is recursive D3.js is also known as D3, and it is short for data-driven documents. It is a JavaScript library for producing dynamic and interactive data visualizations in the web browser. For example, you can generate an HTML table from an array of numbers, or you can use the same data to create an interactive SVG bar chart, bar chart with smooth transitions and interaction. D3 is fast, it supports large data sets and has the capabilities to support dynamic behavior for interaction and animation. In addition to the dynamic and interactive capabilities that D3 has to offer, one reason that we as a research team really liked the idea of using D3 is because of its web browser accessibility. Since we are a research team made up of faculty and colleagues from five universities, we needed something that was easily accessible. We are able to view the structure at any time with a device and internet connection. So we built a tool using D3 where we can pick any three points in the parameter space of the problem and have our visualization show us the structure of the game in that region. Since we have a massive data set, it is really valuable to be able to see a holistic view and the finding fine grained details. These are interactive features that build into this tool. There are interactive features that are built into this tool. One of them is the ability to enter the X, Y, and Z coordinates, and then have a pop-up feature that reveals the underlying mathematical structure to the user. So this is a fragment of D3 code. Um, it pulls data from the server, and it returns the data in the form of a circle, or as we're calling them, nodes. Although their X and Y is different, the radius is the same for all the circles that are being appended or returned, visualized. A term that might be unfamiliar is SVG, which, stand, which stands for scale, Scalable Vector Graphics. SVG is an XML-based vector gra graphic format. It provides options to draw different shapes, such as lines, rectangles, circles, ellipses, Designing visualizations with SVG gives you more power and flexibility, which is something that we definitely needed on this research project. This is another fragment of the D3 code. This is showing us how the pop-up window works in our visualization tool that we'll see in just a second. When you hover over the node, the code would, will return an X, Y, and a Z, and a color in the pop-up window over the node that you are looking at. This is made possible by the D3.tip in the first line. And now we're moving on to the visualization tool. So this is how it starts. We have three parameters, X, Y, and Z, in, a sub in each subtraction set. For each triple, we have a subtraction game. In this menu, we input our X, Y, and Z into the fields, and this communicates with the servers to visualize the structure. So the three sets of X, Y, and Z coordinates that I input are here, here, and here. Everything inside is the structure of the game in that region. The inner part is entirely recursive, so that's in here. This is a holistic view of part of the mathematical structure. As we work on the research, visualizing holistic views is extremely important. It can give us new ideas of where to look in the project and it can act as a guiding point. Having the ability to, to visualize this is crucial in understanding the underlying structure. Although this is a holistic view of the data in this region, it is not all 100 petabytes of the data. Now I'm going on our next slide, keep this in mind, we're going to see more of a fixated view. So it's going to be here, here, and here. So everything inside of this. So in the bottom left corner, over here, we can see the fractal nature of the structure. 
Now this is more of a fine grain detail of what we were looking at earlier. So if we just go back one slide, again, this is what we were looking at. This is what we decided to fixate on. Keep this in mind with this recursive nature. And then we, when we see it here, it has been flipped. So that goes here. Again, we have the fractal nature on this side. So now what if we wanna see another fixated view of the structure? So we're gonna take here, here, and here. Let's look at this structure. This is what it looks like now when you zoom it in. So from over here, we'll use this as our guiding point to understand what we're looking at. And now that is here. So again, you can see the recursive structure along with the fractal nature. If you wanted to, you could just keep zooming in and in and in. It's an extremely, it's, it's just extremely dense. So in this visualization tool, I have three features that I want to touch on. There is a node thicken feature, a pop-up window, and a click feature. So like we saw earlier, the structure is extremely dense. We want to be sure that the user can see exactly which node they are hovering over. When they hover over the node, the node thickens. So you'll always know which node you're hovering over. The pop-up window happens when you hover over the node. It displays the X, Y, and Z coordinate along with the color. When I talked earlier about not all colors being equal, this helps with the structural detection. So the color that appears is what we classified it to be. However, you could hover over what appears to be a blue node, but it will tell you that the pop-up is red. So we know that even though it is a certain period code, the structure of it is technically different. So this is extremely useful for structural detection. The click feature reveals the underlying math. When we click on a node, an alert message will appear with the underlying structure of that particular node. You can think back to earlier with the example with the red and green numbers. Information pertaining to that would be stored in it. So it's one thing to be able to characterize the different distributions of periodicity lengths, but, is actually, but, is act, but to actually see it and visualize it and show everything quickly. So you can start thinking of the next step and what it means. Um, as we saw earlier, this is an extremely dense structure. It is amazing to be able to pick some points in the parameter space, see it, and then pick out the areas of interest that you would like to focus on better. That goes back to the idea of having a holistic view versus the fine grained details. You can see everything. So some of my future work will include incorporating a density feature. As we can see here, the structure is extremely dense. Even if you were to pick up points to create a fixated view, the nodes would stack on top of each other, almost like a parking garage spiral, spiraling down. So we can see that here. The nodes eventually become black and you would not be able to see which nodes are there since they are completely stacked on top of each other. By incorporating a density feature, the team will be able to scale the density better and analyze the structure. When these nodes are coded, none of them were coded to be black. I think at most we might have a dark blue or a navy, but when we see these black regions and even earlier when we were seeing black regions in the structure, these this is just how dense everything is. None of this is meant to be black. It's just so dense that they're stacking on top of each other. These are our references. And then does anybody have any questions for me? Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, just some of the visualizations almost reminded me a little bit of stained glass art. Wow. Maybe the math department could fund uh, window replacement with some of these. <laughs> They're really beautiful. <laughs> But I was curious, um, like, how to, why is it so important to be able to visualize this for the researchers themselves? I mean, how do they, you know, hover over these different little nodes? And what does that actually tell them? 
Yeah, so um, here we can see the X, Y, and the Z coordinate. Mm -hmm. So earlier when we did like the example with the red and green um, numbers, um, say they wanted to look at like an X, Y, and a Z coordinate, they did the math for it and now they wanna see what it looks like, how it visualizes, how it behaves. That's how it helps them. Okay. And so when you run the tool, are you um, directly connected then with like the, the supercomputing at Purdue? Is that how that's yes. run in real time? Is that, wow, okay. Mm -hmm. we, we were worried about the bandwidth today because campus has had some outages. Yes, those darn squirrels at Purdue <laughs> shooting through fibers again. <laughs> So I realized, Natalie, uh, during all the time we spent prepping for you to give your talk, I should have just volunteered to just pull it up here if you like and screen share. I, I could happily do that if you if you want me to. Yeah, I think that would be great even just to show the visualization tool again. But the one trick is I didn't, I, I, sh I'm, I stupidly just didn't make a note of which corners you might write down. If I were to pull the tool up, would you coach me through which, uh, maybe which corners to go take a peek at? Um, let me see, actually, I yeah. might be able to. You had that in the draft of one of your slides. Yes, I did. So, so, wh while she's doing that, I mean, you know, uh, it, I, I, I want to emphasize how how few mathematicians I think are, are lucky enough that they have a tool that lets them go in and directly have a visualization of the thing that they're studying. I, I, I can just attest to not having any such tool for most of my other projects. And um, I, again, this is the second such tool that we've developed. Natalie really spoke to the fact that we've got some regions of our space where things just become super duper dense. Mm -hmm. And then Brent asked about connecting to the supercomputing resources. Mm -hmm. And I've ne I haven't had a tool until I, I, I met Natalie and started working with her that let you zoom in and have a very, very fine grained detailed uh, view of what happens, even of the very smallest portion of your space to really kind of pull apart that that fractal nature so mm -hmm. yeah very Dr. Cool. Ward is very very kind i do have to say that we met in the data mine learning community so i believe i think it was like the first year that the learning community right that's true a freshman so um i didn't have any coding experience prior to college so i was definitely nervous signing up for all of this but wow it is just so worth it i just i can't believe that um, I didn't have any coding experience in high school, um, and I was able to just come here and pick it right up because of the data mine learning community, and I am just, I'm forever grateful for that, because I definitely want to be where I am without it. I, that's very easy. Come on. <laughs> you haven't mentioned the word impatient. I feel remiss if we don't show them that Natalie always teases me that D3 is for the impatient. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She says that's why I like it. Okay, so did you find some triples that I could pull up, my friend? I did. I'm just going to share my screen and just see if it works. Of course. Okay. Oh, you've got the tool. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. The hover feature is just so amazing. Might be a little slow to zoom in out, but. So if we rerun the tool, the colors are, they're actually random. We go in and we just assign random colors and that's 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 not a joke, that's in all seriousness. And the reason is, as Natalie discussed earlier in her talk, there's, on, there's only seven colors that appear. There's like red, yellow, blue, orange, green, purple, and then white. The, the trick is, it was subtle when Natalie said it, we want to know the underlying structure and some of the mathematics underneath the hood for say yellow points are not exactly the same. So you might have a big batch of XYZ points that are all yellow according to that classification and another batch near them that are also yellow, another batch near there that are all yellow but the underlying math is just a little different. So, so, so Natalie, so we just put random colors on there, you know, according to the structure. And if we change it every time, we'll pretty readily be able to see that. And her hover tool is what okay. saved us having to do that all by hand. Like I'm guessing if you run around that very middle point, Natalie, you know, around the, there's a green smack dab in the middle. 
And probably if you walk in a circle around there, you'll see that there's yellows, blues, and greens, yellows, blues, and greens as you go around. But her tool allows us to see a more fine grain split of where, where the math underneath the hood changes. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely amazing too, because say if you wanted to just look at something right here, you would just pick out, you would write down these three points that you have. So 61, 153, and 535. You would do that just around the corners and put that into the into like the input where you would input it at and then it'll just show you what you were looking at earlier so it's just yeah. amazing to be able to visualize all this and seeing is believing sometimes you can write down all of these proofs and under really understand the math but if you can show this to other people they might be able to help you figure out something with it or you might just see something mm -hmm. to yourself that you didn't see before mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you very like a, much. Like a math telescope almost, really, or, or not telescope. Wow. Microscope, right, where you can just zoom, 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 zoom in as much as you want or need to. Yeah, and you, you mentioned that you're dealing with like 100 petabytes of data, which is yeah. kind of hard to wrap. I don't know if anyone could wrap their head around how much data that actually is. And, you know, would this tool um, be able to to be put to use or maybe adapted for like a really, really, really large network of, you know, maybe millions of nodes where you wanted to find nearest neighbors or something like that. Is, is this the kind of tool that you could maybe use to visualize that sort of thing or? I bet you could. I mean, it, it all depends on how the data is represented. I mean, Natalie's program is actually quite general in that regard, right? That if, uh -huh. if, you know, we've seen other maps in Seesaw where you have pretty complicated networks. Yeah. And if you were able to represent it visually and then wanted a very fine grain analysis in different parts where you could dive in, mm -hmm. Natalie, I don't think you would have to change very much of, of your tool. You know, it's quite general in, in that regard that it allows you to do that zooming in. And then you see as she's hovering that feature extraction under the hood is also very adaptable. We just had to put in what parameters we wanted displayed. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of funny because sometimes it comes down to like we would I remember when I was very early working on this project I thought I had this tool done and I said okay Dr. Word let's run all 72 petabytes of data and he laughed at me and I didn't get it at the <laughs> no time. come on oh it was just it was so funny looking back on it because I mean as much as it can the JavaScript can handle the data but we don't have a web browser that would allow us to visualize all 100 petabytes of data so that's also kind of the funny part that comes mm -hmm. with this Hmm. Brent, you've met some of the folks on our team, I think, when they visited Purdue over the years and yes. the ability to be like on a conference call with colleagues. And as Natalie said, just pull up a web browser and, yeah. you know, I mean, Very we're not powerful. doing this, you know, some some commercial tool, right? This is all stuff Natalie's developed herself. I didn't write one line of this visualization. Yeah, it's very powerful. I can remember when the center first started and there was a lot of talk about could we develop tools similar to you know this actually? So uh, this is this is great. Um, thank you so much, Natalie, for your dedication to the project and you know your learning process along the way. I'm sure you have some additional stories you could tell as well. Uh, oh, it has just been it's just been a great experience, and I'm just I feel so lucky to be on such a supportive research team. Um, this did take us some time. I think it took maybe. When I started working, I think it took maybe nine or 10 months to develop this yeah. tool. And that was for me coming with no coding background. So I remember when Dr. Ward asked me if I wanted to work on this, I remember saying, sure, but I've never coded in my life. I don't know JavaScript. I don't know HTML. Um, but it was just, I was in such a supportive learning environment that I was able to pick up all of this so quickly. Mm -hmm. That's very terrific. Very terrific. Well, thank you so much. I, are there any other questions for, for Natalie or, or for Dr. Ward? Okay, well, uh, so we have recorded the, the presentation and with, with Natalie's uh, permission, we'll probably be able to share this through our YouTube channel and let others know about the idea. And uh, Natalie, I wish you the best when you present uh, at the mathematical conference as well. And I'm sure folks are gonna be interested. Thank you, Brent, thank you for having me. You Thanks, bet. Brent. Yeah, everyone take care, stay healthy. And uh, hopefully at some point in the relatively near future, we'll be all back on campus again. <laughs>
So. Hey, your sister's here. I just saw. Hello. Yes. Oh, hello, Elizabeth. How are you both doing this crazy year? <laughs> uh, hanging, hanging in there, uh, doing okay, staying healthy. So I just got my, I was lucky and got on a wait list and just had my second COVID shot yesterday. Oh, that's awesome. So, so yeah, I'm looking forward to um, being able to get back to a little more normal relationships. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I, I heard that you're doing uh, really well at Caterpillar. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like I've been working on meaningful projects and I've only been there for like nine months. It's been a whirlwind, really. It's been moving so quickly, but I've really enjoyed it. Terrific. That's, that's really good news to hear. Yeah. But thank you for putting on this um, research presentation. It's been really nice being able to join this. Like, even though it's been a you know crazy year, but I don't think we'd have this opportunity or idea to put together these presentations if this hadn't happened. So thank you for getting this organized. That's right. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Yeah, and thanks for all of your hard work. As students, I know you juggle a lot in terms of your courses and then to put research on top of it um, and be dedicated as long-term as you both have. That's, that says a lot. And uh, thank you to, to Dr. Ward as well for serving as a mentor. And it, it's made a huge difference to have mentors like Dr. Ward uh, to help with the success of the students and not only let you make mistakes, but then dive into things that you think you can't do. And then you learn that in fact, you can discover things and do things for groups that hadn't been able to do it before. So that's, that's a good story to be able to tell. If I go back three years and you told me that I would know what we know now about our problem, I, I, I would have just found it hilarious. I would have <laughs> laughed a lot. I mean, that's good. really and truly, Natalie's transformed our approach to this whole problem. That's terrific. So, yeah. Good. All well, right. thanks for discussing that, Lee. Thank you. Yeah. Good to see you, Elizabeth. Nice to see you too. Yeah. You. Yeah. Look, look, she stole my office. Did you catch that? Did yeah, you know <laughs> steal my office? <laughs> my office now. I'm sitting in your chair. Oh, no. Go. <laughs> good, good. Okay. Be well, friends. All right. Yeah. We'll sign good off day. and uh, I'll stay in touch and let you, you know when uh, we have it on the YouTube channel so you can share it if you'd like. Oh, great. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. Good rest of the week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.